Yeah? All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, our class here at the Costa Hollywood Resort in Hollywood, Florida. And uh, I am Rabbi Laredo from the Miami Torah Center, and welcome everyone for joining us. Tonight we are going to be learning a very, very important concept, a very important topic, something which hits home. Someone walked in earlier this evening and said, uh, Someone that we all know speaks a lot about anxiety. And I said, what is anxiety? And we started laughing. But the way to combat anxiety is by adding in happiness. Happiness is a big word. The, tonight's title is the attraction of happiness. If, uh, if I were scientific, I would call it the law of attraction of happiness. And that's what we're going to speak about this evening. It's a very, very important concept. It's a concept which we find reoccurring themes in our Torah. We're not going to go, obviously, through each and every one. However, we're going to go through a couple that are really going to help us understand and uh, apply these concepts to our lives. Bezrat Hashem. Um, anyone who would like to uh, sponsor a class in any of our locations, you can find us online. You can speak to me about it and uh, you could call in our office at the same time and uh, we'd be able to help facilitate that and spread even more Torah throughout uh, here in Miami, Florida as well as all over the world. Okay, let's go back a couple books as I say because now we're holding in Deuteronomy and let's go back to towards the end of the book of Genesis. There's a story over there, there's an episode which is one of the sources of the topic of happiness or maybe the opposite when Jacob comes down to Egypt he is right away seen by his son Joseph and they hug and they kiss and they catch up for being so many years away from each other then Joseph is very excited to introduce his father to somebody does anyone know who that was Paro, very good. Faro was the ruler of the land. He was very close with Joseph. Joseph felt very close to Paro. And Joseph said, what a great opportunity to introduce my father to Paro. Comes jo uh, Jacob to see Paro, and something very peculiar takes place. And I'll quote to you. This is in chapter 47. This is the, towards the end of the book of Genesis. This is verses 8 and 9. Paro sees him, and the first thing he says is, Vayomer Paro el Yaakov, Kama yeme shene chayecha. How old are you? Now, when you meet somebody, the first thing you don't do is ask their age. It's insulting to some. I personally don't care, but that could be still because I'm young. But as you get older, I guess you, you start to care more about how old you are and how you look. So the first thing Paro tells Jacob is, how old are you? So look at Jacob's response. Jacob's response was, Vayomer Yaakov el Paro. Yemei shenei megurai shloshim umat I am 130 years old. Me'at viraim. And they were short and bad. There's no other way to, to flower that up. And I didn't reach the age, the ripe age of my ancestors being Isaac and Abraham. Okay? Comes the Dat Zekenim, which is one of the great commentaries on the Torah, and he says, that Jacob passes away eventually 17 years later bringing him to the age of 147. If we look at Isaac, Isaac passes away at the age of 180. Why would it be that Jacob would pass away premature according based on his father's standards? So comes the Dad Sikinim and says, if you count the words that Jacob used 
to complain about his hard life, he has diminished based on that complaint the amount of words for the amount of years that he was now diminished from his life. Now, that's a very, very high level. However, we have to not take his words for granted and let's count the words. If we count the words, so there's 25 words in the second verse and there's eight words in the first verse, that's the 33 years that he was taken off. Instead of passing it at 180, he passes away at 147. Now the question we all have to ask is, but one second, if we count the words that Jacob used, or the Torah refers to as Jacob complaining, there were only 25 words. So why is he punished for the words that Paro himself said? And that is the very answer. The answer is, is we sometimes forget that our face, our composure, and the way we act, as our sages say, is really public domain. In Hebrew we say it's reshut harabim. The way a person looks, age well then you don't ask how old are you and if somebody is looking very very old so then you ask how old are you so Yaakov Avinu unfortunately his lack of taking care of himself is what allowed him to look so old and allowed and caused Paro to ask him that question what we see from here is the importance of our composure and the importance of how we treat ourselves and how we allow ourselves to be viewed by others. Yaakov was punished very harshly. We can't say that any one of us who complain are going to have years taken off from our life. We're not at that level. But Yaakov Avinu, being a patriarch, being the, the greatest of our patriarchs, because he was at that level, unfortunately his very own complaining, and more than his own complaining, his very own allowing Paro to ask him that question, worked against him. Now, the, the idea of being very positive and understanding that our face is Rishut HaRabim, is public domain, really means more than we all Think. And consider the following story. This happens to be a true story. We don't know the last names of the individuals, but, but listen to the following. There was an individual, his name was David, and David had Comes home, nice time, nice conversation. The next day, the wife wakes up and she's in a good mood also. She goes to work and instead of getting into a fight and a disagreement with her other co-workers, she's having a good day at work. They're actually being productive. And the boss, who normally has to mitigate the fights, he comes home to his wife and he's happy also. So look how many people is affected. But the story doesn't end there. This boss, his name was Tony. And Tony had a son named Tim. And they got into a fight and they had a fallout a couple months earlier. And he hasn't spoken to his son in months. He says, you know what, I had a good day at work today. He picks up the phone and he calls his son and says, hey Tim, let's go out for coffee. Let's work this out. Very noble deed. And... He agrees to meet his father, they go out together, and while they're walking and they're talking, the son falls silent and he starts crying. So he looks at his, at his, at the, his father, looks at his son, and he says, my son, why are you crying? He pulls out from his pocket a crumpled piece of paper, and he gives it to his father. And on it, it says, 
to whom it may concern, I committed suicide because no one in the world cares for me. Signed, Tim. This is a true story. And he told his father, I was minutes away from jumping out of my apartment. And you called me and I said, I'll give it another chance. Where did all this come from? It came from that first guy five times ago. That jolly good fellow who jumped into that cab and he was being nice to the cab driver, who was nice to his wife, who was nice to a coworker, who was nice to the boss, and the boss nice to the wife, and then, and then, the wife, and then all of a sudden, all the way to the sun. The way, very good. The way how we, we don't really understand what a smile, what a thank you, what a good word, and what being positive and happy really does. It goes way further than just our Dalid Amot, as we say, our four cubits. It goes way further than that, and it's much stronger than that, and we have to understand that. When it comes to happiness, let's face it, we are all in pursuit for happiness. That is a human being. Very different than an animal, because an animal's brain is 100% reactive. So they're in some way in pursuit for happiness, but it's instant gratification. It's right now. They don't, they don't think. They don't have a financial planner. They don't have... I mean, we have hospitals for them, but they don't, they don't take care of those things. They think of the now. As human beings, we are all seeking happiness. And we try and we try and we always think, we got it, we found it. Oh, when I'm going to have that house, when I'm going to have that job, when I'm going to be married to that person, when I'm going to have children, everything's going to be good. Think again, okay? When I'm going to have this, when I'm going to have this amount of money, and when I'm going to be able to do that, and when I'm going to accomplish this, and when I'm going to have that reward, and this reward, we think always that when I'm going to get there, I will be happy. However, that is very simple-minded, and I hate to say it, it's stupid. We are robbing ourselves from the truth, and this is our yetzer hara, our evil inclination, working on us time and time again. Because how many times have we got to that goal, and very soon after, we're not happy? You wanted that new phone. You wanted that new car. You wanted that vacation. You wanted to meet this certain person. And we always think, I'm going to be happy when? And I'm going to be happy when? And it just doesn't happen. So what is the secret to happiness? How do we fulfill that pursuit of happiness that we are actually all looking for? We're all looking for, in one way or another, success and a feeling of gratification. And happy is a big word. How do we attain it? And this is what we're going to learn about tonight. Sometimes, and not sometimes, more often than not, we need to stop and think. The problem is we don't do it too often. But tonight we're going to go through, it's going to be a little different than the regular classes we give. It's going to be more of an exercise. Okay. It's going to be more of an exercise. And when I say an exercise, we're actually going to have to think tonight. It's not going to be like we're here and Rabbi Laredo spoon feeding you. No, you're going to have to pick up your hands. You're going to have to dig into the dish yourself. And watch what I mean by that. We're going to go back to a while back. And we're going to go to something which I like referring to very often. And this was written in... Uh, 190 CE, okay? And this is the famous book of Pirkei Avot. Yeah, the common era. Now, this book is the key to human morality and ethics. Of course, it's all based on our Chumash, but this is the oral teaching of each and every one of the Tanaic sages. And they say the most powerful lessons that even nowadays the greatest psychologists, the greatest therapists, the greatest motivational speakers, all draw tremendous amount of wisdom to share with everyone. I'm going to go to the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter has a series of four questions 
which you and I, if we would have never learned the Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our fathers, we would have said the exact opposite. Listen to the question. Ben Zoma Omer, Ezehu Chacham, who's a wise person? So who would you think would be wise? What would your, again, if you never learned the Mishnah, what would you say is a wise Who's someone strong? So what I would think is someone who could bench press 500 pounds. Is that even possible? I don't even know. Okay. Somebody who could lift a car. Somebody who could pull, pull a whole yacht single-handedly. That's a strong person. Someone who could crack a pencil with their pinky and their thumb. Have you ever tried that? It's very hard. It's almost impossible. That's a strong person. No. You know what the Mishnah says? HaKoveshet Yitzro. Someone who's able to overcome their very own temptation. Can we try to put all phones on silent? That would be... If you put it on silent, you won't hear it. Okay. The Mishnah says, that's someone strong. Strength is not measured here. Strength is measured with a combination of where we put our tefillin which is a combination of our heart, our arm opposite our heart, and our minds. That's someone strong. Someone strong who's able to make the right decision. Ezehu Ashir, who's a wealthy person. So you would say, someone who has 10 digits in their bank account, that's a wealthy person. Someone who's wealthy, they own real estate, they own the whole block. Is that a wealthy person? Wrong. You know what a wealthy person is? Someone who's happy with their portion. We're going to explain what that means. That's obviously tonight's main topic. The last one he says, Who's someone who is an honored person? So you would think the honored person is everyone who goes and honors and stands up for them. No. An honored person is someone who honors others. If you respect someone else, everyone else, and you honor everyone else, that makes you and qualifies you as an honorable and a respectful person. Each and every person, that will reciprocate right back towards us. So on our topic, and we, we all came out here tonight to hear a tremendous novelty. But the novelty, we know. But tonight we're going to learn how to fine tune that, adjust it, and apply it to our lives. There's no secret pill to take for happiness. Any pill you take for happiness will bring you depression faster than you've ever seen. This is clinically proven. Unfortunately, there is a huge statistic, and I I don't want to quote a statistic because it's changing every day, of the amount of people who are on antidepressants. And the truth is, in the beginning, it all starts off for a good reason. There might be a real, real traumatic issue that they're going through. It might be that they're really suffering. It might be a physical suffering. It might be something emotional. It doesn't matter. However, a segula for the opposite of happiness is taking a pill for happiness. That's not what works. Like anything in life, if something's presented to you and it looks too good to be true, you know what it is? Not true. There must be something behind that. And so too in life. Anything we want to grow in, anything we want to succeed in, we need to work hard for it. We need to toil. Rabbi Shimshon David Pinkis, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, a rabbi that I love quoting, he says, you know where you find true happiness? You find through the success of your toil. 
When you work hard for something and you see the finished product afterwards, that is true happiness. That has a gratification and it's the opposite of instant gratification because you worked hard for it. The way to find happiness is picking a project, going for it, putting everything you have into it and seeing it flourish. That's real happiness. Now a project doesn't mean and it's not limited to a physical project. Of course, we all are thinking of that. That also works. But there's more than that. There's a spiritual project. There's an emotional project. There's an ethical project. A person has a problem lying. It's just a part of their nature. And they don't even do it on purpose anymore. A person has a problem taking things that are not theirs. And they almost don't even think about it when they do it. A person has a very, very short fuse and they constantly are getting angry for the most petty things. These are all spiritual projects that when a person works on and works hard on, they see the results, they really appreciate it. Now, there's a true story that Rabbi Noach Weinberg, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, the founder of Eshe Torah, he was very known to preach the concept of happiness. And he says he one time met a man who told him the following, that when he was 11 years old, he was taught a true lesson in happiness. When you hear the story, you're gonna really be baffled by how an 11 year old could be so mature to think of the following conclusion. This 11 year old child was driving a bicycle. And when he was driving a bicycle, there was a strong gust of wind which pushed him over and made him fly into an oncoming truck. The truck ran him over and unfortunately severed one of his legs from his very own body. Horrible story. The kid's lying on the floor and he's recounting this again as an adult to the rabbi. He's lying on the floor and he's thinking to himself, that's it, my life's over. Either way, if I die, it's over. And if I live, what type of life is this? The child at the moment, he's lying down on the floor, he's gushing blood. He makes a decision, he says, if I'm gonna cry about this and whine about this and complain about this for the rest of my life, is it ever gonna give my leg back? It will never help. He made a decision at that moment, before We feel so bad for you, what's gonna be? He said, nothing's wrong, 11 years old. Nothing's wrong, everything is good. Look at how much God left me with. And that was a true lesson in happiness, to which Rabbi Weinberg was known to do the following exercise. And he says, go back to when you were 16, 17, 18, depending on which country you were born in and where you grew up. Your greatest dream at that time was, anybody? Being able to drive your own car. That's every teenager's wish. It's having your own car and driving your own car. Again, yeah, now you're looking like, eh. But a couple years ago, or a couple decades ago, depends how old you are, every child is looking forward to the day that they have the freedom to get in a car and go wherever they want, whenever they want. And then what happens? You got your dream car, you're able to go where you want. But your neighbor got a nicer car. And then you have in mind, so you know what the greatest next thing is? Is to have a nice boyfriend or a nice girlfriend. And then after some time with that person, eh, well, what's that worth? And everything that we've ever wanted in life unfortunately became stale. And it was this marketing project of happiness that the greatest companies of the world that we live in today try to sell us this idea of happiness, which is one big scam. Because happiness is not a happening. Happiness is a state of mind.
I'm going to repeat that. I want you to remember this. Happiness is not a happening. Happiness is a state of mind. When we are able to decide that with whatever I have and whatever I'm lacking, I'm going to be happy no matter what, you're going to be really happy no matter what. But if all of your happiness is dependent on exterior motives, other people, other tangible items, well, when those people and those items are there and they're interesting, well, then you're happy. But if you're lacking it and it's no longer there, or if it's already boring to you, well, doesn't mean anything else to you anymore. So the question is, is how do we turn and how do we motivate our happiness to be a positive happening opposed to it being something dependent on many exterior motives? In order to answer that, we're going to clarify three misconceptions. And based on these three misconceptions, we're going to come to a very strong conclusion and a practical advice that I can guarantee you if you go home and you do this, your life will be different. The problem is, is most people hear this and they don't go and do this. So I'm going to try my best to sell it to you. Misconception number one is that when you understand how something works, it's very easy to do. And that's not true. Because understanding the way to build a computer or to fix a car or to do something specific is very different than actually doing it. There's watching someone do something, there's hearing about someone do something, and there's doing it yourself. I can come out here tonight and tell you the way to be happy. But you will never be happy unless you exercise it and do it yourself. I can tell you, you want to build muscle, you pick up this type of weight and you do this amount of reps and you jog and you bike and you do and you this and you watch your eating habits. Do you know that unfortunately sometimes the greatest dietitians themselves are overweight or not healthy? How could that be? It's because it's not only knowing or understanding what to do, it's doing it. It's practicing what you preach, but who cares about what you preach? It's for your own good. For your own good, how do you do so? And with happiness, it's the same. We could all say, I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy with what I don't have. I accept it all. It's a bracha from Hashem. It's a gift from Hashem. But do we really believe it? How do we get to believing it? So we'll answer that. Hold that thought. Second misconception. That... If I become satisfied and happy with my life, I'm going to lose all my motivation. In business, we are taught that we need to be ambitious. We need to be motivated. You need to be a go-getter. You need to go produce sales. Or do whatever it is that you have to do in that realm of business. But if I'm happy with what I have, what's going to give me the motivation to wake up in the morning and get to my office on time? or contact the customer, or create a new program, or, or, or build a new business, whatever it is. How can I be happy with what I have that's gonna kill all my motivation to build my life in every way, in physical realms, in spiritual realms, in emotional realms, in, in every way possible? The answer to that I'll give you now is it's the complete opposite. If you know someone who's really happy, you can tell and you can vouch that they are the most motivated people that walk the face of this earth. Because someone who's happy is energized. When you are energized, you are drawing positive energy towards you and people want to do business with you. And people are going to see you
someone who's happy. Someone who's happy is happy with what there is. No matter what the situation is. Because when we realize that God put me in that situation specifically, it couldn't be any better. It could not be colder or hotter or better or worse in any which way in every situation when we realize that it's the chelek, it's the portion God gave us. So how do we make this practical? How do we come out of tonight really feeling happier? Because speaking about being happy and even selling us the concept of when we're happy, we really change our whole surrounding is still not the easiest sale. So listen to the following. It's a three-pronged study. And this study is done in a lab, but it's done in the lab of our very own minds. And it's an exercise. The first is a beginner level. And then you graduate to an intermediate level. And then there is the expert level of this experience. It's pretty easy to remember, so it's something which I think each and every one of us can try doing. And if not, you could always contact me and I'd be more than happy to repeat it to you. It's pretty easy. The first level is far, starts as follows. Think about everything that you are grateful for to Hashem and speak about it with your family. Have these conversations. Sometimes as parents we forget that the communication that takes place at home and specifically with our children are really the things which form them to either be secure and confident human beings and adults eventually or the opposite. If all our children see us do is huff and puff and roll our eyes and slam on our phones and breathe heavy and rub in our eyes well then, what do they think adulthood's all about? It's about being stressed, it's about having anxiety. That's all what being an adult means. Complaining about this bill, and complaining about this person, and about work. to it. Spend one hour and write. Approximately you should get 100 things that happened in your life that you are grateful for to Hashem for happening. Everything. Things as simple as being able to see, being able to smell, being able to taste, being able to touch the people you've met, the people you are happy that Hashem guided you away from, the things that you were waiting for that you got. There are Thousands of things, but just write 100 and stop. And every day, just add one new thing. Nothing should be repetitive. And it gets tough. So you'll go through the first 20 really quick. You're going to think a little bit about the next. And you'll get to 100 eventually. And you add one new every day. Because then comes the day where something dramatic happens in life. God forbid, a physical illness. You lose a family member. Lose one's fortune, chas v'shalom. And the world looks so dark and gloomy at that moment. And it's very hard to focus on all the good there is. Because with the 1,000 different chemicals, if we'll call them, or components that we have in our lives, the mistake we make is when one or two or ten go bad, that we close the whole briefcase and we say everything's worth nothing. And this is also a story which took place, and this is not a one-of story, of a gentleman who had his office on the 70th floor of the Empire State Building. 
And he happened to look out at New York City one day, and he sees someone's legs dangling from the floor in front of him. And he, he, he flipped out. He didn't know what to do. He ran upstairs and he saw a guy standing on his window ledge. And he was screaming, I'm jumping off, no one's stopping me. So the man came and he said, this gotta be, this, this is not happening to me. This is like, you only see this in movies. This is not really happening. And the guy says, well, nothing you tell me is going to stop me. Because I'm jumping over and I'm jumping now. So he plays in his mind and says, okay, so I'm supposed to convince him out of it, right? Okay, so let me try. So he tries. And he says, well, what happened that you're so angry at life that you're jumping over? Oh, I just got divorced. My children hate me. I just got diagnosed with cancer. I just lost two million dollars, my life savings. And he kept on going and going and going. Ten minutes of non-stop <coughs> horrible things. The guy trying to convince him not to jump off in his mind is thinking, well, you better jump off. It's probably in your best interest. But he obviously didn't say that. That's not part of the movie, right? Okay. So he's like, no, no, you must, there must be something you're grateful for. And he's thinking, what could it be? So he says, wait, wait, wait. Maybe this is going to work. And he says, can you imagine, sir, if you were born blind? And you wouldn't be able to see anything. All the people you've met, all the great sightseeing, everything great you've done, you would not be able to have seen any of that. So he got the, men's, the, the, the gentleman's attention and he goes, okay, then. Well, wouldn't you say it'd be worth it to spend a couple more days or weeks on this earth using those eyes? He says, well, yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay, well, you have those eyes. Use them. Just because 10 things are wrong in life, it doesn't mean everything deserves to be flushed down the toilet. And I'll give one more analogy before I give you the, the expert level of this exercise. Because again, the beginner level was thinking about everything you're grateful for to Hashem and speak about it with people that care for you. Second is going and putting it in writing. And when you put in writing and you add every day to it, you're going to build a long list and you're going to be really surprised with things that we take for granted that we really shouldn't. For example, in the morning we have Birkot HaShachar. Part of our Jewish ritual every morning is to thank Hashem for the simplest things. To thank Hashem to see, to be mobile, to stand up straight, to have legs, to walk, to be able to relieve oneself. That we were created as Jews, as free. These are things that we take for granted. You know that one of the things on that list is thanking Hashem for giving the Jewish people the Torah. Could you imagine what our life would be like without Torah and without mitzvot? You could imagine what it would look like. Look at the rest of the world. That's the second level. But now before the third level, listen to the following. Can you consider that you're driving your car and God bless you, you just got a brand new car you're loving the car okay it's driving well it's picking up nice it smells new raise your hand if you like the way a new car smells no there should be more hands up come on honestly a new car smells amazing there's nothing like the smell of a brand new car okay so you're driving your new car and someone bangs right into you. Are you happy? Well, if you're leasing the car and you have insurance, it's not the end of the world, besides for the couple hours and the deductible you're going to have to take care of, but you're still not happy. But let's say you bought the car and you still don't have it under an insurance. And you're really not happy. Okay? Imagine at that moment, and let's consider this to be not a simple car, a nice sports car. Okay, so just getting your imagination running. And you're about to get out and yell at the top of your lungs at this person that just smashed into this car. And in the meantime, you get a phone call. Now this is only imagined because I don't know if this is ever going to happen to you, but just think about it. The analogy is still very valid. 
you get a phone call from theparable.com. And they say, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, you just went, won the $250 million lottery. And you just, you're like, one second. Is this a prank or is this for real? Sir, this is for real. Do you have such and such number? Is this your address? Please, is this you? Yes. How do I get to you the quickest possible? How do I claim this? Well, half of it's going to taxes, but besides for that, so you're still left with $125 million. I don't care. Where do I need to be? Do you for a moment think that you care about that person that just banged into your car? Absolutely not. A billion dollars? I'm sure someone in here is too shy to say for a billion dollars they'd do it. Okay, how about one eye? How about one eye? Yeah? Okay, we have one taker. Anyone else? One eye for a billion? We have the money outside, okay? <laughs> okay. What about your fingers? You got ten fingers, right? Can you spare me one? Just one. How much? <laughs> And your toes, and your ears, and your nose, and your arms, and everything you have. We are, as human beings, priceless creatures. And what we do is we allow petty issues take over our lives. Now, in all honesty, they're not petty, but it's like a paper cut. Many people, when they get a paper cut, the whole day needs to stop. The whole body is focusing just on that finger that got the paper cut. And for, for one aspect, rightfully so. We actually use that analogy for the positive. Chachamim tell us, Kol Yisrael, Arivim Zelazet, each and every Jew is a guarantor for one another, and we're all supposed to care for each other. Literally, like when one part of my body is aching and hurting, the whole body cares about it and all of our nerves are drawn towards that so too we should care for each and every one of our brothers and our sisters but on the opposite on the flip side we can't allow one or two or ten issues which are weighing us down weigh us down completely and have us completely stop and this leads me to the third exercise the third exercise is, is extremely challenging. Again, I'm, I, I first hope everyone starts with one and then two. The third exercise is take a list. I want you to take five pairs, okay? Five pairs of items that you put side to side that you have. Five gifts that God has given you and put them side to side and say, which one of the two means more to me and why? So for example, if you would take, I mean, we gave a lot of these examples, different parts of your body, your tongue or your eyes. Just this exercise, because we all know no one's coming and giving you and paying you for your tongue or for your eyes, but just the exercise of thinking, which one would I want more? And why? That is just an exercise, like we said in the beginning. Happiness is not just going to come by speaking about it. It's by doing something to grow with it, to exercise it.
to really make a difference in our lives and to become happy people. Because deep down we can all find happy moments in our lives. But it's about taking that and making that the norm and making that the majority and eventually making that our totality of our life, of always being happy. And that is again, first identifying what is happy, what makes us happy, what we're happy for in our lives and grateful to God for and speaking about it with our friends and family. Then putting it down on paper, putting a hundred down on paper and then adding one every day. And the third is now making a competition, so to say, or a cross analogy. Which of the two would mean and worth more to me and why? And we'll end off with the following. That when the Mishnah tells us, as we quoted, who is a wise, who is a happy person, someone who's happy with what they have, it means happy with everything that you have. It means happy with your height, the way you look, the parents you have, the siblings you have, the job you have, the strengths you have, the weaknesses you have and every aspect of your life. Because that's your chelik, that's your portion. It's being happy with all the happy times you had, and being happy with all the struggles that Shem sends your way. Because if you're not happy with it, I'm not saying that we should be looking for these hard situations, but if they came our way, it's definitely because Hashem decided that that is what be- is best for you at that time, and it's what's gonna promote the greatest amount of growth for you, which at the end of the day is why we're here. Human beings are here to grow. Anything that is not growing is classified as dead. A plant that is no longer growing dies. A human being which is not actively growing unfortunately is is as if they are no longer there. So by us growing through our happiness, which is easy sometimes to grow through, but also growing through our struggles and our hardships, that is what brings true gratification, true success, and whether we appreciate it or not while we're going through it, brings true happiness. It's being thankful to God for that total package that He gave us. How can a person thank God for being raised as an orphan? How can someone thank God for being raised as someone who's handicapped. How can you be thankful to God for raising you in a family that is suffering from poverty in a tremendous level? It's very hard to. But it's through realizing everything else good that's going for us that we're able to cope with and survive and grow through all of those hardships and those very struggles. The sages tell us the acronym of Ashir, which means wealthy, are things which are so simple. Ayn, which means eyes. A wealthy person can see. Shin is shinaim, person who has teeth. Can you imagine if you didn't have teeth? How would you eat? Yud is yadaim, hands, and resh is raglaim, feet. If you have your basics, you have so much to be happy about. And to this, I'm going to end off with getting us in the mood of Rosh Hashanah because next week is going to be Rosh Chodesh Elul, the beginning of the month of Elul, which is the whole month where we dedicate to preparing for the holidays. And that's Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur specifically. And what we have to understand is that on Rosh Hashanah, we're coming to God and we're not there to beg and to ask for things which is contrary to popular belief. Oh, Rosh Hashanah is a great opportunity for me to ask for everything that I need. No, that's not the point of Rosh Hashanah. You know what the point of Rosh Hashanah is? The main point of Rosh Hashanah is recognizing God as the king of the world and as our very own individual king. And when when we recognize that everything that Hashem does is for our best, We are happy with the very fact that we lived another year. And we come to just ask Hashem to give us the simple blessing that we take for granted of having life to live another 
year. Now everything's in perspective because someone will come and say, well, Rabbi, what's the point of living a life of suffering? I'm better off not to be here. It's all a matter of perception. When we perceive the struggles Hashem sends us as anxiety, as a waste, as no point, well then, yeah, you're just going to sink yourself down and you're never going to grow out of that. But if you take all of those struggles and you grab life by the horns and you say, I'm here to rock this ship along with you. I'm here to grow. I'm here to help others. I'm here to fulfill my purpose in this world. Well, then every moment of life and every moment of the year is a tremendous blessing and we realize that. So our blessing that we're going to hope upon all of us, our families, friends, and all of the Jewish nation is that we will find within our own lives countless reasons to be happy for. And let all of those reasons, because they definitely outweigh, but logically outweigh all of the hardships that we have in our lives and focus more on the lottery ticket that we get called on and not the person running into our car. And may that be our blessing for today, for this month of preparation for Rosh Hashanah, and this blessing for this new year of 5,780 for ourselves, our families, and all of Klal Yisrael. Amen v'amen. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes.